In the southwest of Africa, between the skeleton coast and the red sands of the Kalahari, lies Namibia. In this arid land, host to the oldest desert known to man, water takes on a mysterious and almost spiritual value. The greatest canyon under the southern skies, gouged by the force of the Fish River, shows none of the rays that still cause its passage towards the sea. But below the crusted sands of Namibia, legends exist of vast lakes, rivers and hidden caverns visited only by wandering spirits. Sometimes, legends do exist. Such a place was described by the explorer Charles John Anderson in 1851 as the most extraordinary chasm it was ever my fortune to see. Today, mystery and legend surface at this phenomenon known as Ochicotto. The Herero call it the place where cattle will not drink and believe that if man or beast were to fall into the pool, they would inevitably perish. Stories are told of a whirlpool which will draw swimmers to the depths of the earth. Seventy years ago, a young postman dived into her darkness, his body never to surface again. In 1914, war broke out in Europe. Southwest Africa, as it was then known, was occupied by Germany and posed a threat to British shipping. After the fall of the capital to South African troops in 1915, the surrender of the northern garrison at Tumeb was imminent. The German commander ordered that all artillery and ammunition be loaded onto 20 ox wagons and transported to the lake. There, with ropes and pulleys, the Schutztruppe hauled the equipment to the edge of the crater and heaved the armaments into the lake. Legend has it that one unfortunate soldier had his leg caught by a rope and was dragged over the edge forever to haunt the depths of Ochicotto. Tumeb today not only hosts the most prolific gemstone mine in the world, but also a museum with a history entwined with that of Ochicotto. One day an old man came to me and he said, Mrs. Schatz, I got a secret. And please come with me to the Ochicotto Lake. And then he told me the story that in, in 1950, before the surrender, he was a soldier and he got the order to drop into the Ochicotto Lake a, a safe. It was slated and he thinks there was gold and documents inside. Now a group of ultra-deep diving specialists has arrived at the lake in order to unearth the secrets of Ochicotto from below its surface. Buti Schoen is one of Namibia's foremost diving instructors who has brought the group together. A previous Africa deep dive record holder, he has pioneered mixed gas diving on the continent. Ben Bernardi is head of the Namibian Police Task Force and co-holder of the 132-meter African record. The expedition is the brainchild of Bernd Tannerberger. He is responsible for much of the technology used during explorations. This expedition has a couple of purposes. Let's start with the oldest one of them all, and that was to finish or complete then the surveying of the lake, which we started two expeditions ago. By using the metal detector, try and find the safe or some of the German equipment that's buried beneath the mud. And then secondly, I'd say using the ROV, go down and tape as much footage as possible, especially underneath the ledges that's never seen, been seen before. Uh, they are talking about the safe, but uh, it's basically mapping out the area and get more information uh, of a hole that's been, we have been diving there for many years and, and up till now is the first time that, that that sort of research is being done in the lake.
in order to locate the mystery safe and other artifacts under two meters of mud and sediment. Our divers have obtained an underwater metal detector for the duration of the three-week expedition. You'll have to get back to that rope to come up. You can't free yourself. I wouldn't suggest it. We went down to the deep side of the reef, 37 meters, and we used the metal detector to see if we can't find huge objects like cannons or ammunition carriers uh, buried beneath the mud. We covered from 37 to 40 meter distance, shallower up to about 29 meters, uh, sweeping two meter area from left to right. We were a bit scared that we would not be able to distinguish between the various objects, that it would be with just one continuous sound we were going to get out of the metal detector. But uh, as I discovered from Butti that uh, it actually does identify the various objects and gives us the shapes depending on how you move the machine around. So from that point of view we're happy that we can start uh, searching now in earnest. The success of the expedition is largely dependent on a ROV a remote operated vehicle which our team is currently testing for buoyancy problems. This sophisticated piece of technology is basically a submersible video camera with a number of propellers attached which can be forward or reverse controlled by a surface operator. In front of the camera is a depth meter and compass which help the operator to navigate the vehicle to depths below 100 meters. The ROV is to be sent under overhangs and down unexplored tunnels to film areas far too dangerous for our divers to enter. Stompy Hanib, a Damara inhabitant, remembers the surface of the water being almost level with the rim of the crater. Decades before his arrival, the Haikon Bushmen, who know the lake as Tsaisib, the place to be scared of, controlled a copper ore trading post at Ochikoto. Armed warriors guarded the surrounding hills from unauthorized mining. Before bartering with the Haikom, the Ovambu traders had to announce their arrival with a fire at the trading tree. As game in the region was steadily depleted by European hunters, the Haikom followed the herds northward, away from Ochikoto and towards the great Etosha Pan. Another legend of this thirsty land, Etosha Pan is believed by the Haikom to have been formed from a mother's tears. When a group of strangers wandered into hostile territory, they were surrounded by a band of hunters who savagely killed all the men and children but spared the women. A mother sat under a tree cradling her dead baby. She wept so much that her tears formed a huge lake which through the passing of time was dried by the sun to a sandy clay, so encrusted with salt that nothing would ever grow on it. Modern science tells us that the pan was formed a million years ago when the Great Lake was shaken by violent tremors, which cut off the source of its water. These earthquakes also caused underground fractures further to the south. In time, the dolomite rock slowly dissolved through the flow of rainwater, eventually causing a massive cavern. The cavern became so large that it could no longer support the roof, which thousands of years ago collapsed to form Lake Ochikoto. Now exposed to the rays of the sun, unique fish evolved below the surface. Endemic to Ochikoto is the dwarf bream, or southern mouth brooder, which has a particular color form found nowhere else in the world. The Guinness tilapia has evolved among individuals a myriad of colors, ranging from pure black to mottled black and blue and yellow and white. Today, the exotic Mozambique tilapia also compete with the longer established tenants of the lake. The tilapia fiercely protects all available nooks and crannies along the walls of the lake, in fear of having their offspring devoured.
The fish have yet to feel the effects of local irrigation, but a greater threat faces Ochikoto. If possible, plans go ahead to supply the central region of Namibia with water from this area. The president of the Namibia Underwater Federation has flown 600 kilometers from Vintuk to visit our expedition. As one of the first underwater explorers of Lake Ochikoto, Theo Skumon started diving in the lake nearly 30 years ago. When they threw the um, arms and ammunition in 1915, the first divers actually came up from Cape Town about two months after that, and they started diving, and they dived along the edges and they actually took out quite a lot of things, something like about two, um, uh, 200,000 Mauser bullets and about 4,000 cannon shells, and they used grapples and hooks as well. That was in 1915 to 1916. Since then, nobody dived in this lake. The first time I dived in this lake was around about 1969, but there were such a lot of myths about this lake being connected and having whirlpools and all kinds of funny things, but we didn't experience any problems. We went down to 40 meters, searched through the area, uh, found one or two ammunition carriers. One of those ammunition carriers we then subsequently um, salvaged and uh, that was taken to the Winter Museum. A decade later, three divers from Tumeb Philip Oppermann, Rob de Quinnen, and Tulio Pereira discovered cannons embedded in the mud of Ochikoto. Salvage attempts began to retrieve the cannons for the museum. On one of these attempts, a cannon slipped off a float. A steel cable released itself and snapped around the wrist of Tulio Pereira. His hand was severed from his arm and Tulio was thrown from the pump platform down into the water. The salvage gun was subsequently named Tulio and now stands in the Tsumeb Museum with a collection of artillery retrieved from Ochikoto during the 1980s. Lack of oxygen and the depth of the lake have preserved the relics intact, even the labels on the ammunition boxes perfectly retaining their original printing. Uh, that is one of the fascinations that uh, I have with this, is what I've seen in the Tumut Museum uh, that my friends have already lifted. Uh, cannons, various types of ammunition, ammunition carriers which have been taken out and are being displayed in the museums. Of course from the list uh, that the Germans drew up as they threw the equipment in, we know that there are a further 21 cannons in this lake which have yet to be found and then of course the ammunition that goes with it and various other items. So it's still an intrigue and it, uh, it's still like a treasure hunt. We cannot call ourselves treasure hunters. We've been diving here for many, many years and, and I, can, I can actually you know, look you in the eye and say we've never received any money for what we're doing here. It's for the benefit of everybody. Once we find the safe though, look, the temptation is always there. If it's filled with gold, what can I say? I'm also a poor man. But I'd say no, I, I really think that, that we'd give it to the government and the museum, yes. Two previous expeditions have been organized by our team to survey the walls and floor of Ochikoto. To do this, they mounted a boat's echo sounder horizontally, feeding readings up a 100 meter cable to their monitor. The readings were given to a computer graphics artist in order to render a three-dimensional image of the lake's interior. These images, showing massive lateral caverns, are now used to plan further explorations of the crater. The diving we're doing now here in the Ochikoto has reached depths that you would classify as technical diving. The average sports diver seldom exceeds a depth of 30 meters, needing little or no time for decompression. The Ochikoto, however, is unique in that it requires our team to combine deep diving and cave diving techniques at around 60 meters in depth, equivalent to 70 meters at sea level. 
At these depths, a real danger faces the divers through a condition called nitrogen narcosis. I'd say some of the first symptoms would be a tingling sensation in the mouth, like if you put your tongue, let's say, to a terminus of a battery. Uh, if the diver then goes deeper, he will start feeling lightheaded. Uh, next thing would be that they would start losing the dive plan, losing concentration on the breathing rhythm, and going beyond 60, 70, 80 meters, of course, hallucinations will start forming, uh, overconfidence, feeling of well-being, and of course, in the end, coma and then unconsciousness will follow. To overcome nitrogen narcosis, mixed gas containing helium is used to replace the nitrogen, resulting in the sharpening of the senses. Decompression sickness, or the bends, caused by the expanding of nitrogen in the bloodstream during surfacing, is also a severe threat faced by our divers. To overcome the bends, the team is equipped with sophisticated dive computers to calculate decompression stops where nitrogen is released from the bloodstream. In 1991, after achieving their Africa record of 132 meters, Butti and Ben spent six hours returning to the surface. Today, Ben is plagued by chronic sinus pain, frustrating him in his attempt to assist the expedition. I was advised by some do an operation on it, but it's a 50-50 chance. But maybe when I get back to town, I will have a, a doctor look into the into the situation to see if, if there's anything that we can do because I cannot continue like this. Midway through the expedition, the divers have mastered the technique of driving the ROV deep into the underground caverns leading off from the lake. Although not without mishap. We had a dramatic moment uh, about 15 minutes ago. The ROV got stuck somewhere in one of these caves, or what we think is a cave or some other uh, gorge. And uh, we were already making plans of getting it back out uh, with Trimix diving. Luckily, uh, the cable operator did a fantastic job and he pulled us out. That's the box, Tabu. Yeah, that's the box, Tabu. Yeah, well, lungs is the gun on. Look at the chemicals running out there. Do you see the chemicals coming out of the box? Okay. Ah, that is the interesting. What is that? What is that? Box. 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 Try lung with that. Try lung. Try lung. Can you see the box? This white here is the is the official. What shall we call it? Dispatching papers. What the hell is that? And that's in the net lungs on the Goof. Okay. He fought okay. no, it's it's it. It. It's a box. No, this is all new stuff to us. Quite, quite happy about this. That's fine, yes. For three weeks, our divers worked relentlessly, covering 2,400 square meters of mud floor spending a combined period of 96 hours underwater in darkness. The floor, once disturbed, would reduce visibility to zero. Dangerous situations did arise. A diver exhausted his air supply, but managed to surface. A camera light imploded at 40 meters. Ben's sinus continued to plague him. Despite this, unique footage was filmed in caverns never disturbed by man. A rowing boat verified as pre-First World War has been discovered, and new ammunition boxes have been uncovered in areas previously thought barren. But the safe has not been found. If it is there, they'll find it. Definitely, they'll find it. If you take two years, five years, ten years, They'll find it. And we will hopefully assist them as far as possible as we can. But we're all getting older, and the younger guys now must learn. And they must take it further. The end of the expedition is imminent. For the last time as a team, 
the divers prepare plans and decompression tables from a program developed by Butty Shern. Looking at all 16 fish individually. This time they will breathe trimix while diving to the core of Ochikoto's legendary status, the cannons of the German Schutztruppe. Okay, why do we use helium and why are we on trimix today? The guys are going down to the cannon, which is at a relatively deep depth. We are looking at a depth of about 60 meters. At that sort of depth, you have the nitrogen narcosis effect. Now, the mixture the guys are using today, they have a 50% helium content. They have nitrogen of about 39.5 and oxygen of 10.5. The depth that is calculated is for 70 meter seawater and that will complete their trimix dive and they should have a fantastic dive at the cannons and see everything as clearly and as normally as they would on land. I would very much like to see this lake preserved as a German artifact type museum. I think it's quite unique and I really think that it is for divers and of course for the country uh, to realize that it's, it, you, its uniqueness and also try and preserve it as such. I think the underwater museum to start off with I think is a fantastic idea. I think it also serves a purpose that the stuff will not be moved out of the lake, which would be a real pity because half of it would be lost, uh, disintegrate and be destroyed. We are totally against uh, taking the stuff out of the lake. What we uh, see is that the moment that you take the stuff from that depth, and especially from the mud down there, it started to rust. So the oxygen levels down there are very, very much less than and it is on top. And I think that's the main reason for preserving it in that uh, condition. This Ochikoto has got a very, very soft spot in my diving place. I, if I can, I'd, I'd, I'd always return here because there's, there's, it's so vast down there and it's so beautiful. And the chances of, of finding new you know, war material is, is always there. No, I, I think I'll always come back. Mysteries, as I told you from the beginning, each and every dive has got its own mysteries and has got its own uh, experience in just doing the dive, getting down there. Today you find this new boxes, tomorrow you find that new ammo boxes. And no, I still say that this lake is, is worth many, many dives. The future of the Ochikoto uh, is tremendous. For, from a diving point of view, I think we've still got many, many, many years of diving to come. The reason being is that it is not well known. Uh, it's mysterious. Around every corner there is a new discovery to be made. So uh, from a diving angle, I think there are many, many years and many hours of diving still to come. The ultimate depths of Ochikoto have yet to be charted. Legends and mysteries remain. An old soldier reported an aeroplane dumped into the lake during 1915. A bag of diamonds was alleged to have been thrown into Ochikoto by a man pursued by police. A German war inventory lists 21 cannons which remain in Ochikoto. Ochikoto still has not relinquished the mysterious safe. To this day, the whereabouts of the six million gold marks of the former imperial government is still unknown.